testing and your patients. Okay, good morning colleagues once again. Um, thank you very much for attending this webinar where we will be targeting um, medication errors and ensuring that we bring it to your attention with regards to more information pertaining to that. So my name is Flora Matlala. I'm the pharmacovigilance manager within the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority. As you may be aware, the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority is responsible basically for ensuring that medicines that are available on the South African market are of safety, um, efficacious and acceptable quality. So it is in this regard that we have put this webinar together to bring to your attention um, the topic around the medication era. Why would we have decided to have done that? The reason basically is because we have noticed that medication error reporting is actually at the bottom compared to other suspected adverse drug reactions. So as part of our mandate, we need to make healthcare professionals and the public in general aware of the reporting of medication error. Hence, we have put this webinar together so that we can talk to the issue of medication error and bring it to your attention. So what is the objective basically um, out of this webinar. So firstly, we need to ensure that you understand as a healthcare professional, what is a medication error and how would you be able to identify it? And then furthermore, 
what steps would you put in place to mitigate it? What are the public impact of medication error in general, be in South Africa or globally? And then how would you prevent medication error moving forward? Furthermore, what is SAPRA's role when it comes to medication errors in terms of reporting and feedback to healthcare professionals with regards to medication errors? So having said that, we have a panel that will be talking to the topic today. Firstly, I'm going to introduce to you Ms. Busisiwe Mosani. Ms. Busisiwe Mosani, kindly share your face. Um, who is the medicine regulatory officer within SABRA? She's a pharmacist by profession and she has attended several courses pertaining to pharmacovigilance that are provided by the Uppsala Monitoring Center in Sweden, uh, in Switzerland rather, and then as well as the MHRA in the UK. So she has joined the unit in 2016 and then she's responsible for ensuring pharmacovigilance awareness throughout the country. Thank you, Busi. And then the next then it will be um, Dr. Sarisha Singh, Dr. Singh, kindly show your face. Then Dr. Singh is a pharmacovigilance, is a pharmacist also by profession who holds a doctorate and she's based at the uh, hospital in the Eastern Cape and uh, she's responsible for medication error reporting at the hospital where she's based. She's part of the pharmacovigilance advisory committee member within SAPRA. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh. And then lastly, we've got Prof. Blockman, who is the professor at the University of Cape Town, and um, she's also the chair of the Pharmacovigilance Advisory Committee um, within SAPRA. Prof. Blockman, may you kindly show your face if you can. And um, I will therefore hand over to our first speaker. And our first speaker for the day then is Dr. Singh, who will be taking us through getting to know medication errors. Dr. Singh, please take the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Florian. Good morning to colleagues. I will share my screen. So my presentation is getting to know medication errors. The objectives is to understand the concept of medication errors, discuss the impact on patient safety, describe the a medication error reporting system at, in a hospital setting, and to share the medication error reporting form used at the hospital. So what is a medication error? The National Coordinating Council for Medication Error Reporting and Prevention defines a medication error as any preventable event that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm while the medication is in the control of the healthcare professional or patient. Such events may be related to professional practice, healthcare products, procedures and systems, including prescribing, order communication, product labeling, packaging, compounding, dispensing, distribution, administration, education, monitoring and use. So we can see that a medication error is possible at any stage of the whole process. Let us now look at some international data, which varies. So for example, in the UK, uh, they have approximately 0.03 per 100 admissions to about two to five per 100 admissions in the US. Each hospital in the US experienced a medication error every 22.7 hours. That's about every 19 admissions. Adverse patient care outcomes occurred in 0.25% of all patients admitted to these hospitals per year. Now the total cost to the US annually was between 17 to 29 billion dollars. 
if you saw this advert in the news, would you fly? No. Yet, what about a patient in the healthcare system? So, the airline debt, um, if it was 100 deaths expected weekly, that equates to the actual number 40, in between the range of 44,000 to 98,000 deaths annually due to medication errors in the US. The 44,000 to 98,000 is actual data. So what is the impact on patient safety and why is identifying med errors so important? To err is human, but we need to identify system errors to minimize patient harm as outlined below. Most errors are not a result of individual negligence, but arise more from systemic organizational failures, that is faulty systems processes and conditions that exist within the organization that cause healthcare professionals to make a mistake or fail to recognize and prevent mistakes. Whilst most errors are harmless or are intercepted, some result in harm to the patient. Harm may be potential or manifest in the form of disability or some manner of reduction in patients' quality of life, hospitalization or prolonged hospitalization or even death. Medication errors also result in increased costs to the patient, the institution and to the healthcare system as a whole. Costs are not necessarily incurred in terms of monetary value but also in terms of a loss of trust by patients in healthcare professionals or by patients and healthcare professionals in the healthcare system itself. Through identification, we can decrease the number of medication errors. So we can identify errors, but then what? Leap et al. have emphasized the importance of a systems-based approach where the emphasis shifts from the individual making the error to the characteristics of the system within which they function. Hence, reporting of medication errors is crucial, but traditionally has been punitive. Studies conclude that 45 to 95% of medication errors are not reported. If reporting is inadequate, we cannot identify problems. Prof. Blockman will talk more on the reporting. It is against this background that the implementation of a medication error reporting system was introduced at our hospital, which is a resource constrained setting in and um, the whole idea was to also contribute to the quality improvement cycle. So while most errors are harmless or are intercepted, as I mentioned previously, some result in harm. A medication error reporting system would therefore serve to identify trends in medication errors and implement methods to reduce the incidence of errors thereby enhancing therapy that is safe and effective for the patient and decreasing costs for the institution. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit more from a hospital experience. So as part of our hospital standardization, we needed to have a system whereby medication errors are spontaneously reported thereafter analyzed and intervention made, made so as to improve systems and minimize the number of errors. And this happens through the clinical pharmacy department at Freer Hospital, where we collate 
all the reports on a monthly basis from the wards and the pharmacies. And we use a specific medication error reporting form that was adopted from the NCC MARP. And there's three main areas of focus. Uh, so it's, the form is based on the type of error, cause of error, and the contributing factors. So this, these are snippets from the form. The first one is describing the event. Um, so for example, if you have a patient that weighs 60 kilograms and is on RHZE um, five tablets daily, uh, that would be in the description of the event. So it doesn't have to be long, but it needs to convey all the necessary information. As you can see, we do not display any names of who made the error, as this is a no blame system. Going on to the next slide, which is on the classification and outcomes. I will explain a bit more of how we classify the category of harm shortly. So first, we need to know whether the error reached the patient, and if it did, was a dose taken or administered? And then, if any harm was caused, uh, will be in the middle block. So for example, if a patient uh, is on morphine, and there was a dose omission of morphine, and the patient experienced pain, that would be temporary harm. So this is the categories of uh, harm. And we can see like, for example, in category C, the error reached the patient but did not cause harm. As you go up the categories from D, from E, F, G, and H, I, it becomes more and more serious. But having said that, we should still report category A, B, and C errors because we are trying to prevent errors from happening. The next section of our form is on the type of error, and it's a tick box system, uh, so there's not much writing to do. I'm just going to highlight a few examples. So for type of error, uh, we have dose omission, improper dose, wrong drug, wrong route, etc. Just to illustrate, as, as we know, MDR TB is highly prevalent in South Africa. So uh, if there's an improper dose, we need to report that. Uh, an underdose, we know that the consequence is it could lead to resistance or if you have a patient that is overdosed, that could lead to toxicity. Another example, for example, with the dose omissions, it says dosage omissions of antiretrovirals or antimicrobials in the wards, this can lead to resistance. The wrong time, for example, if furosemide is charted to be given at 8 a.m. and uh, 2 p.m., but instead is given at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., then that is a wrong time category. Or levothyroxine, if taken before food instead of, sorry, if it's taken after food instead of before food, then you would take a wrong time. Another example, wrong rate. As we know, if we infuse amphotericin too fast, that can result in the patient experiencing fever and chills. So if the rate is too fast, you would then tick the category of wrong rate. Now to all these types of errors, there is a, um, there could be a cause. So that brings me to the next part of the form, which is the cause of errors. So an example is failed communication is manifested in several ways. Poor handwriting can result in erroneous distinction between two medications that have similar names. 
This situation is exacerbated by drug names that sound similar. So in the example, you can see the handwriting. Can you read this? Neither can I. And then in the example before, uh, below, we name confusion. For example, if uh, Lasix, uh, 40 milligrams da uh, daily is prescribed, and the handwriting was not too clear, it may be interpreted as low sec, 40 milligrams daily. And these are uh, some of these examples are things that we've actually experienced at the hospital. Moving on to contributing factors, which is one that we don't always know, but it could be something uh, that may have contributed to the cause of the error, for example, noise. Uh, perhaps there are new guidelines out and not everyone is trained on it. So, you know, these could be the contributing factors there, or there could be policies and procedures that need to be updated. The setting of the error, this becomes important uh, so that we know where to target interventions. For example, if you find uh, there's a trend of errors in the inpatient's pharmacies for a specific uh, drug, or the pharmacists are not calculating the milligrams per kg per dose, or, or anything of that sort, then we know where to target the intervention. As I mentioned earlier, this is a no blame system. The, this is the only part where a name, um, you know, is presented on the report. Uh, the, the reason for this is that if there's any further information that we need, we know who to contact. So it's just the reporter whose name goes onto the form. So what do we do with all this information that we get? We um, put it into access, or you can do pivot tables, and then we generate some data. This is just an example. So if you found that like improper dose uh, is an issue or a trend, then you know where to target that intervention. Perhaps there were new TB guidelines that came out, different weight bands, um, and resulting in a lot of improper dosages, then you know where to target the intervention. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in pediatrics, uh, a lot of milligrams per kg per dose was not calculated, resulting in overdosing or underdosing in pediatrics, maybe in a ward. Uh, you could do some training in that area. Another example, there's lots of graphs that we can generate. Another uh, example, which I haven't shown you is, uh, on the form is the ATC class. We do have a block for the generic name and the ATC class. So in this one, the most prominent one is J01. J01 is your antibacterials. And there you could uh, do some antimicrobial stewardship training uh, on that. So all of this just helps with targeting interventions. So what happens with the data? that is generated from the reports. Trends are identified and presented to management monthly and to the pharmacy and therapeutics committee. The PTC is central to an efficient program for the maximization of rational medicine use, which includes amongst other aspects, the correct dispensing, administration and prescribing. A quarterly report is presented to the quality assurance team. Ways in which to improve systems and reduce the medication error numbers are sought. Thereafter, these systems are implemented and routinely monitored to ensure ongoing quality improvement. Just a few closing thoughts. Prevention, not punishment, is our goal. Counting interventions is not the objective. Identifying vulnerabilities is. 
systems analysis, action, and feedback are essential. Finally, safety is the foundation upon which quality is built. In this diagram, what I'm trying to portray is we are not trying to blame anyone. We're not trying to shoot anyone, not trying to put anyone down. It's not about one profession triumphing over the next profession, but it's rather working as a team to ensure safety for the patients we serve. These are my references. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh <clears throat> and colleagues. I think um, from Dr. Singh's presentation, we can basically take the message that this is not a punitive measure. It's actually a measure to improve the reporting systems and ensuring that we work with the with the system. So follow on to Dr. Singh, then I'm going to introduce to you Prof. Blockman, who is the medical scientist and professor of the clinical pharmacology at the University of Cape Town and Hrodeskel Hospital, also the chair of the pharmacovigilance um, advisory committee here at Sabra. Prof, the stage is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. Um, Flora, can I confirm that you can see my slides? I can see your slides, Prof. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful, thank you. So this is around to err is, is human, and uh, and I think uh, Dr. Singh mentioned the fact that uh, this is not about finger pointing, but working together and collaborating in terms of reducing uh, medication errors and adverse events and protecting our, our patients that we manage on a regular basis. So this is the uh, doctors versus gun owners. This is the number of physicians in the United States is about 700,000. And the accidental deaths caused by physicians is 120,000. And the accidental death per physician is 0.171. When you look at the gun owners, it's about 80 million. And the number of accidental deaths per gun owner is about, uh, is about 1,500. And so the number of accidental deaths per gun owner is very, very, very small. So statistically, uh, doctors are approximately 9,000 times more dangerous than uh, gun owners. And remember, guns don't kill people, doctors do. And uh, the important thing is not everybody has a gun, but most people have at least one doctor. You may have more than one doctor, which is really problematic. And so you must tell everybody about this, and we should probably be banning doctors uh, before this gets completely out of control. And so out of concern for the public, I haven't uh, discussed uh, the stats on lawyers, because it may lead to people having to seek uh, medical attention. So this is some of the stats. There's less than one death per 100,000 encounters is nuclear power, railroads and airlines. One death less than 100,000 in driving and chemical manufacturing. When you look at, at healthcare, healthcare is one death per 1,000 encounters with bungee jumping and mountain climbing. So we're in the same reams as people who uh, or bungee jumping or mountain climbing is the risk when you enter the healthcare space. So, you know, if you saw this, would you fly? Airlines expect one to two jets to crash daily, uh, over a thousand deaths expected weekly. Would you actually fly? And we just look at the amount of uh, medication errors uh, due to medication errors. Um, uh, would you actually take a medicine? Now, the problem with medication errors is that there's no ICD-10 code for it. So often there's complete under-reporting and under-recognition of, uh, of, of medical errors. But if you look at that, the stats over here, would you actually uh, want to take a medicine? Just some common adverse events. Uh, this is erythema multiforme, just for your uh, review. Uh, this is gingival hyperplasia due to calcium channel blockers like amlodipine. It also co gets caused with phenytone as well as cyclosporin and good oral hygiene hopefully prevents that. And that's a message we have to tell our patients. And this is warfarin skin necrosis. Um, and this is where you don't overlap with heparin in patients early on with uh, who are thrombophilic and uh, they develop warfarin skin necrosis with severe uh, requirements for debridement and surgery. So medication errors, any preventable event, and that's really important. And so 
whatever we do, we have to look at a system. We have to help each other prevent these events. And then you can get inappropriate medication use or patient harm. And there's a whole, it, it happens in the whole um, uh, prescribing environment that uh, these events uh, can occur. And it's really, how do we develop a system? How do we make people aware? How do we be non-punitive? And how do we uh, develop a system to prevent these events? Here's some data. This is the amount, uh, proportion of adults admitted to a uh, to hospitals, a systematic review. And, and, sorry, and Prof. Can, uh, sorry. Um, I'm seeing there's one person who indicates that they can't see the slides. So oh. I just needed to confirm that um, the cause from your side, is everything okay? Yes, I can see them. Melanie, you can, can you see the slide? Prof, maybe you can also um, take yes. off your camera. I can do that. Just give me one second to learn what to do, if you don't mind. Okay, I think it might be that particular person. Everybody's saying they see in the slides. Yes. Okay, thank okay. you. We can carry on, Prof. Thanks. You sure? Thank you for that. Yes. So if you look at the data, um, the admissions for uh, adverse drug events, it's around you know four percent to six point three percent, and that's the amount of people who are being um, admitted due to an adverse uh, event. That's really terrible, and we have to develop a system to try and reduce that. Uh, we did some work at Somerset Hospital, and we showed that it was about 6.3% of the time people would be admitted due to an adverse uh, event, and 41% um, was at least uh, preventable. This is really frightening. Um, in, in, in some work that we did looking at four medical wards in South Africa, that ADR has accounted for 8.4% of admissions. But if you look at the deaths, 18% of the deaths of inpatients in medical wards was due to a medication, due to a medication. That is, that, I mean, it's one fifth of the population is being, getting into trouble due to a medication. And 50% of the time they were preventable. And that gets back again to each of us helping each other and developing a system. So who's at most at risk is the elderly, and I won't tell you who I think is old or not. And so this is really useful to look at. This is the beers list, and it's, it's really consistent. And basically, it's looking at uh, an inappropriate medication, in, it, it, but it's independent of the condition. You just give this medicine to somebody who's elderly, there's a risk of them getting into trouble. And then the other list is basically, if you have a condition and you give a medicine, uh, they get into trouble. So it's just there are some medicines that just are very problematic in the elderly. And I'm just going to show you a few of them. Endomethacin, and you can talk about all of the non anti inflammatories. They're all problematic in somebody with bad kidneys already. They switch them off. Amitriptyline, if you look at how much amitriptyline, low and high dose, is prescribed to help people to sleep, not just pain syndromes or depression, uh, you're providing anticholinergics. So, first is sedation and people fall, and anticholinergics to the elderly. And remember, anticholinergics raise dopamine and make the elderly people confused. Long acting benzos, uh, people, to, people fall, and obviously, um, the short-acting ones, and then mineral oil, which people are fixated on their bowels, and they use uh, mineral oil, liquid paraffin, often at night, and they take their last dose, lie down, and they, they aspirate. This is really consistent, uh, and, and this requires um, an advi advisory process when we are looking after people who are old. And this is just in, dependent on the condition, and I just want to show you uh, again, uh, tricyclic antidepressants, there they are again, um, metoclopramide, nobody cares about the use of metoclopramide in patients. It's a go-to agent, lots of generics, and if we just remember, it's a neuroleptic and it's a dopamine antagonist and can worsen um, Parkinson's disease. And then anticholinergics for incontinence, for example, again, they all raise dopamine in the brain and can cause people to be, uh, become confused. And so one needs to have a system, a cheat sheet, in terms of how we prescribe uh, to, to patients. And no matter what you control for, it increases obviously harm, but healthcare costs across the, across the board, inpatient days, outpatient visits, casualty visits, just um, from the harm. And you can control for age, sex, comorbidities, total number of prescriptions, you get the same risk, unfortunately. I'm, I'm, I'm really a, a, an advocate a, a, a for the appropriate use of non-anti-inflammatories. They really cure nothing and probably very useful for gout 
and then for pain relief. And so we need to be very careful about the use of them. There are hidden monster anti-inflammatories in, for example, uh, the, the multi-component analgesics, and people forget. Uh, and the elderly take it, they develop ulcers or worsen their heart failure, the hypertension. And, uh, and when you look at the data, it's very difficult to control, but they are high risk of causing adverse events. And if we looked at death, um, it would show that in fact, about 15, 15th most common cause of death in the United States is a nostril anti-inflammatory. Remember when you bleed into the into gastrointestinal tra tract, you can't see the blood. So you actually don't know. These people are dropping their blood pressure, dropping the hemoglobin, and you don't know why. So again, it's polypharmacy. Right? And, uh, and it's not difficult to have somebody with high blood pressure, hypertension, sorry, hypertension, uh, ischemic heart disease and diabetes and get uh, and, and have to prescribe a huge amount of medicines. Okay, And if you look at the ambulatory problem, uh, it, it leads to the fourth to sixth leading cause of death, and it's commonly due to polypharmacy. Okay. Again, drug interactions, three to five percent of the hospital admissions, and uh, a movement to uh, emergency care is a drug that interacts. Okay. In 1980, when I was around, medical school graduates needed to know about 60 drugs well. In 2006, it's about 700. You don't really know what it is now, but it's, it's obviously over a thousand drugs that you have to know well. Okay, And I'll show you some data that drug-drug interactions increase exponentially with these numbers. And, here's the, and here it is. Eight is 28 pop, uh, potential drug interactions. 16, very easy to get a 16. 120 potential drug interactions. So we have to have a, a system, a cheat sheet, an app to allow us to, uh, to quickly look to see if I'm, we're going to cause harm. Some safety tools, training, memory, and best efforts, you know, guess, guess, guess. Dear doctor letters, uh, people don't read them well, and uh, which is really problematic. Package labeling, professional information, uh, people don't really read them. Electronic medical records, that's really useful. To be able to have the person's electronic medical record um, uh, available to you at the time of prescribing, seeing allergies, other drugs, really useful. And then for people to do drug use reviews, just to see how well we're doing and then feedback in a non-punitive way. And I think this is absolutely correct. Asking an individual doctor to rely on his memory is like asking a travel agent to memorize airline schedules. They never do that. Uh, it's always a computer, there's always a system to decide uh, what the airline schedule uh, looks like. And here's some drugs removed from the market, you'll remember, uh, due to drug interactions. And, and one of the commonest risks is QTC prolongation uh, with torsade. Uh, Tofenadine, Estemazole, Cisapride, Cerevastatin, these are all caused torsade due to a drug interaction. And here it is, here's torsade, it's potentially uh, fatal and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and due to QT prolongation and there's an escape uh, cardiac rhythm. And so the common types of medication errors, incomplete patient information, allergies being a major problem, what other drugs they're taking, what's the other comorbidities, the unavailable drug information. If we really looked very hard, we're going to find that people don't have up-to-date uh, drug information and the warnings and new understanding of what drugs can do, and then poor handwriting, and I'll show you some of that, uh, and, and drugs with similar names, and we just get it wrong. So here it is. Um, this is for Isordor, but the patient was given Plendor, and this is rest in peace, and Dr. Singh showed you some of these examples as well. Is this hydrochlorothiazide 50 milligrams or hydrocortisone 250 milligrams? Is this 60 uh, regular insulin uh, units or is this six units? A big difference between, between the two, just pure on poor handwriting. So Leap said medical error is not fundamentally due to lack of knowledge, but not putting our knowledge into practice. And I quite agree with that. OK, so what's the way forward? Well, we need a, a mnemonic. OK, and this is avoid mistakes. We've got to know about allergies, vitamins and herbs. Uh, people take a lot of vitamins, a lot of herbs, old drugs and over the counter medicines. People are scared to volunteer that there's a lot of over the counter. We've got to ask about that. We have to have a system, a cheat sheet for interactions. And obviously dependency, benzodiazepines, withdrawal, and then family history. And with pharmacogenomics, family history is going to become obviously very important. So more tips, age, as I've suggested to you, liver and renal disease, um, very important to dose adjust for um, renal impairment or hepatic impairment or not use the drug at all. 
I really think we should prescribe as many drugs, as few drugs as possible, and tell patients what to inspect, expect and tell them what the risks are so they can report back to you if possible. Be careful um, uh, prescribing the wondermycin, that new drug that uh, the reps come out and tell you about. You really need to um, inculcate information before you start prescribing, and then obviously write neatly and no abbreviations. Okay. Harry Truman said, doing the right thing is easy, knowing what it is is actually more difficult. And this is one of my favorite slides. I feel a lot better since I ran out of those pills you gave me. Thank you very much, everybody, and um, thank you for joining us in the webinar. Thank you very thank much, you very Prof. Much, that was that a was great a one. Um, after this presentation, I'm not sure if I still want to go and see a doctor. But luckily, we've got a process in place that will actually assist so that we can continue seeing our doctors. So moving on, then we have the role of the regulator, and that will be presented by Ms. Kusisiwi Masane, who is the medicine control officer within the pharmacovigilance unit of SAPRA. Thank you, Pussy. Um, really um, thank you, Flora. Um, good morning, colleagues. So let me share my presentation. Laura, can you confirm if you can see my presentation? Yes, I can. Thanks. Thank you. Um, as Flora has already mentioned, uh, that we are going to talk about the role of uh, the regulator in the detection and management of medication errors. And Uh, my apologies, um, I seem to have shared the wrong one. Sorry about that, colleagues. Can I share from my side? Would that be fine? No, I'm sharing just now. It would take long. OK, thanks. Uh, can you confirm, Flora, if you can see my screen? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that, colleagues. All right. Um, as I said, we'll be talking about uh, the uh, role of SABRA in the detection and management of medication errors. But before, let me talk about um, what SABRA does. So we are mandated by Act 101 to regulate all health um, products and their use in South Africa. But today we'll be focusing on monitoring of these um, uh, health products or focusing on the monitoring function. So does everyone see the slides? I see others say that they can see the slides. Yes, we can see them. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as I said, we'll be focusing only on the monitoring function uh, where we ensure that the evidence of existing um, medicine safety problems, they are reviewed and acted upon. And this is achieved through
through the pharmacovigilance system. So um, through the pharmacovigilance system, the regulator is able to um, identify the safety problems and also understanding these uh, medicine safety problems. But most importantly, uh, the prevention on the, of the medicine uh, safety problems uh, through mitigation and awareness programs such as this webinar today. Um, so what is the scope of uh, pharmacovigilance? So since the inception of the WHO program for international drug monitoring, after the thalidomide tragedy in the 1960s, the national pharmacovigilance centers have been concerned with minimizing the risk of uh, mainly adverse drug reactions. However, over the uh, past 40 years, uh, the pharmacovigilance system has um, also focused on other medicine safety problems, including the uh, detection and prevention of medication errors. So since we're focusing on medication errors, um, I'll only uh, focus on it and also talk about the example there given of 45 children in Uganda who received um, quinine injection, but this injection was poorly administered and the, uh, the children were uh, paralyzed as a result. So um, since we are focusing on only the medication errors, let me uh, give you a different definition from the ones that you've heard from uh, previous presentations. Um, there are actually 26 different terminologies employed for medication errors. So today, um, we are going to focus on this uh, definition, which talks about a failure in the treatment process that leads or that leads to or has a potential uh, to lead to harm uh, to the patient. So harm here, uh, we may say that it's an adverse event. So the medication errors may lead to adverse events or at times maybe potential of um, leading to, to such events. So uh, from the definition, let's look at where SAPRA fits in the treatment process. So we fit in the manufacturing of medic medicines, right? and also monitoring of medicines. So here let's talk about the manufacturing of medicines. Um, we'll see here that there is um, an example of two products from the same company. However, they look alike. So um, there is a potential of picking, if one is prescribed, of picking either of them, most especially if they are placed um, close to one another. So here we have received um, a report from a pharmacist who reported this uh, potential error. And um, this uh, then had to be um, reviewed, the report had to be reviewed by SAPRA, where we communicated with the applicant to also to be able to change the outer packaging of the product. So this is one example. And then let's go to another example. Here is two products of different strengths from the same company. 
However, again, there might be, although the difference here is only on the color, one has an orange cap and the other one a yellow cap. But if they're also placed uh, next to one another, it's possible that uh, there might be um, a picking when one picks in uh, the pharmacist picks the medication in the pharmacy would would pick uh, the wrong one. Or also administration when uh, these have to be administered. If one strength is prescribed, then the other one might be administered. Okay, let's also look at the um, similarities in naming medicines. So this is failure in treatment process as well. Uh, here we have an example of um, administration of BCG culture SSI instead of BCG vaccine SSI to newborn babies. So these two products look the same and instead of the newborn babies receiving the vaccine, they received the culture and then the results were that these ba babies contracted TB. And then it was identified that the cause of the administration error was due to uh, similarities in the names of these two products. However, one is a culture, but the other one is a vaccine. But if placed next to one another, the um, picking might be uh, different or administration might be um, uh, be a problem uh, and lead to um, an adverse event as we see in this example. So as I said, that the regulator, we focus on the treatment process. We are Base, uh, we are focusing on manufacturing and also monitoring, monitoring benefits and outcomes of um, medication errors in, uh, in this case. So um, let's now talk about uh, the reports that we receive. So the, the reports that we receive through our system, as I've mentioned, that we are the member of the WHO program international drug monitoring. We so submit the reports received to the global database, and this database is called VGBase. So uh, this information that we see here is up to September of uh, 2022. Um, our continent, Africa, only contributed 1% of the reports that uh, are on Fiji base. And the others, you, we can see the Northern, uh, North America is 52% and uh, Europe 28%. We are the lowest at 1%. This shows um, under reporting in our continent. Uh, so here the origin of the reports in VGBase still continues. So from the, those 1% uh, of the reports, 4,205 medication errors are from the Afri uh, African countries. And this is 0.4% of the global medication error reports. And this uh, is 99% of all the, the, the um, reports, which is uh, 3,874, right? OK, or oh, this is from uh, other uh, um, uh, Egypt, sorry, Morocco and South Africa. OK, let's now look at the top five reported medication errors that we received. 
the inappropriate schedule of product administration is one of the top five medication errors and the incorrect dose administered and then the wrong product administered the product administration error and the product prescribing error these are the top five medication errors however as we have seen that the we have a problem of underreporting in our continent perhaps uh, if if the reporting increases this would also change but for now this is what we have seen up to september of uh, last year moving on looking at the outcomes of the um, reports that we receive uh, we see that um, in South African data, there is 67, this is of the 67,000 reports. So the outcomes is uh, about 6% led to death and 31% led to prolonged hospitalization. So uh, we see the, 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 the seriousness of these reports uh, through these outcomes, as these are the serious uh, criteria uh, used by WHO. And the other one is life-threatening at about 10% uh, or so, okay. And this is 1.5% uh, of all the reports from the VG base. This is a South African data. Now looking at the reporting and detection of medication errors. How does SAPRA uh, detect or receive medication errors? We receive medication errors through spontaneous reporting of medication errors by healthcare professionals in uh, healthcare facilities, mostly those that have are having high level of patient care. So we have seen an example of the Freire uh, reporting tool that they use. And of which um, not most of the hospitals do have this reporting uh, tools. But um, as a regulator, we are also now developing a reporting tool or reporting form that the healthcare prof professionals would be able to use to report. So, and the other, um, we also received by, from patient, uh, um, reports from patients, although there are not as many, but they do report the medication errors. And also on how do we identify medication errors through these reports that we receive. So we, by improving the reporting system and to optimize the detection of medication errors, as I've indicated that we are in the process of working on a, on a form um, of medication error specifically, because we were thinking of also incorporating the fields of medication errors, what the, the medication error report would uh, require. However, with the adverse drug creation reporting form that we have, the, it wouldn't be possible to incorporate all the fields. So what we are doing is developing or, or adapting the Freire reporting form, as we have seen from the one that uh, Dr. Singh alluded to. And how do you identify medication errors as well? It's by assessing preventability. So we've seen from the previous uh, definition that the medication errors 
are can be preventable. So by assessing preventability of these medication errors, we'd be able to identify them and be able to mitigate them further. So moving on, we are now on reporting and we'll be talking of, about reporting tools that we use as SAPRA. We not only um, focus on adverse drug reactions, right? Also the adverse event following immunization reporting tools, which are available on the SAPRA website. And we also have electronic reporting tool, the e-reporting, which is available via that link that you see there. And once one reports, let's say re report under or use the paper-based reporting tool, then you would send the adverse drug reaction reporting tool to the ADR at sapra.org.za. And here are their contact details. Is there any uh, queries that you have regarding reporting of adverse reactions or medication errors? So we also have the Med Safety app as our reporting tool, which is accessible um, via Sabra as well. And one can use their smartphone to download the Med Safety app. So there, there are benefits as well of using the Med Safety app, but I won't go through them. And how, as Sabra, how do we analyze medication errors? Um, the root cause analysis method is used. However, this is what we um, would like to do. We haven't started on the root cause analysis as yet. However, this is how um, other regulatory authorities would analyze medication errors. So, and this would also be able to inform the regulator of the un underlying causes and the contribut co contributory factors and be able to mitigate these errors. Now let's look, after having looked at the presentation, let's look at our role as SAPRA, having um, spoken up, uh, gone through the presentation itself. We collaborate with other pharmacovigilance stakeholders, such as the uh, healthcare professionals and um, adverse events following for adverse following adverse event following immunization, we collaborate with um, EPI and the LISEC committee, which are responsible for a uh, causality assessment of adverse event following immunization. So if we are to collaborate with pharmacovigilance uh, stakeholders and be able to uh, learn from one another about the medication errors, would be able to um, be able to mitigate them. And the other role that we play is raising awareness uh, through this webinar, as I've already said. And there are other webinars as well that we have um, hosted in uh, previously. And we are hoping again that in the future we'll host other webinars targeting on um, different or uh, target audience. And another role is on improving existing individual case safety report tools. This is the form that I was talking about that we are currently developing and will be able to share with uh, stakeholders for comments. And the utilization, sorry about that, to utilize specific tools to identify preventable adverse drug reactions. This is what we hope to, 
to to um to do as a as a regulator and uh, since we are learning more about the medication errors we will also be learning about how to use specific tools or of identify preventable adverse drug reactions and implementation of risk minimization errors this include uh, uh, the healthcare professional letters that uh, Professor um, Blockman had already spoken about, and also the um, product labeling changes. That in a case where the, the example that I've shown you with two products from the same uh, company. Uh, that we had to speak to the company to be able to uh, make the two products uh, not look similar, that the uh, pharmacist would be able to uh, not have a problem of picking the wrong product instead of the other. And the other role that we play is developing of uh, proprietary names guidance document. Um, there is a guidance document <clears throat> that the names and scheduling unit has developed that focuses on harmonization of proprietary names worldwide. And this is a mandate that the uh, WHO has uh, taken following the increased um, medication error reports. So this SAPRA has a five-year approach, which has started in 2019, and uh, they are changing or trying to harmonize the names of uh, medicines available in South Africa. And this helps in harmonization of all the proprietary names not only in South Africa, but worldwide, as I've said. So in conclusion, um, proactive and reactive strategies to prevent medication errors should be considered in all settings. Hence, collaboration is very important here. So the health uh, care professionals, the pharmaceutical industries as well. So we should be able to collaborate and be able to uh, use proactive and reactive strategies to prevent and mitigate um, medication errors. And also, as the other presenters have already said, that uh, by reporting, um, it's it's not a punitive measure, but we are trying to see the medicine safety problems that we are facing as a regulator and be able to deal with them accordingly. So again, reporting is not admission of guilt. So a healthcare professional should, shouldn't be afraid of reporting and thinking that they'll be punished and thinking that they, they are the ones that caused the safety uh, medication problem. However, you'd be assisting us in mitigating this uh, medication errors. And the most important thing is, as you've all also seen from the form that Dr. Singh has uh, shown us that um, your identity or will will not be will not be um revealed confidentiality here plays an important role we um we adhere to the popia act so don't be afraid that your name will be known that you have um caused the adverse event or the medication errors so we are encouraging healthcare professionals to please report adverse events, including medication errors, so that we'll be able to mitigate them and learn again, most importantly, learn from them 
And yeah, that's the most important thing. So thank you all for your attention. And these are my references. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Busi, for the presentation. And from this presentation, I think it's quite important that um, we take away the fact that there's a need for collaboration in ensuring patient safety, be it healthcare professional, pharmaceutical industry, sub rather patients themselves. It's quite important we, that we collaborate so as to ensure um, patient safety in general. So this uh, was actually our last speaker, so we have came to the end of our presentation with regards to medication errors. And I am hoping that um, we have actually reached the objective of this webinar, which is actually to increase the awareness regarding the medication errors with regards to being able to understand it and identify it, being able to report it, where to report and how to report, and what systems can be improved within the organization or the facilities where one is working and as well ensuring that these are actually rooted to SAPRA so that we can look at the systems from our side and improve that as well. So having said that, we have came to the end. Um, I will then um, be going to the questions that we have and um, taking the questions then to the uh, panelists. Okay, Dokozo, you need to guide me. Will we be taking hands? as well because I've seen several hands coming through um, from our audience. Uh, no questions only on the chat. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, um, you Okay, now that's fine, Mel, you can go. Okay. Um, show you the first question. This as per the morphine example, it's from Nikki Hall. As per the morphine example, why is the missed dose of morphine a medication error and not a missed dose? Please advise. I'm not sure when the panelists can answer. I think that question was actually raised during Dr. Singh's presentation. Dr. Singh, are you able to respond? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, it is an error in that we know that the patient is on morphine in the ward, it was an example, um, but perhaps it wasn't reason, uh, it wasn't administered, it, it could have been not ordered, uh, you know, sometimes not everything like this morphine is not always ward stock in uh, the different wards, so maybe for some reason it wasn't administered, and uh, we must also remember a medication errors any preventable event, anywhere in the whole process, whether it's dispensing, administering, or prescribing. Hence, I classified the missed dose as a medication error. And then on the form, uh, when I was going through type of error, dose omissions is listed as a type of error. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. I think the second one is related to the second question. Have you seen an improvement since you implemented the system and carried out? Example, retraining. Thank you for that question. Um, the process has been in at our hospital for many years. Yes, we have seen an improvement um, in the system. As time goes, though, we have found that we need to retrain because we have uh, new doctors, new pharmacists, also, information guidelines change as time goes on. So it all depends on what uh, trends you are seeing uh, from the reports on a monthly basis. And um, yeah, so we, we try to identify where in our system, uh, what is going wrong, and we try to put in interventions in, in that way. Feedback on in interventions is key. So that's the main thing. We have found uh, reporting has decreased uh, at times quite drastically. So we have to keep on retraining on the whole process and on the form uh, usage to all healthcare professionals. Thank you. Um, 
I'm not sure if this was in relation to Dr. Singh's presentation, but the question is, are these medication errors reported to the supplier or manufacturer if it causes patient harm? Okay, um, thank you. So no, we haven't reported any to the manufacturer. Uh, we've only uh, reported any product complaints. But uh, regarding the med errors, we found so far at our hospital, as I mentioned, it's due to systems, maybe there's a lack of training, has been more internal issues and hence we target our interventions in that way. We haven't had uh, the issue of similar packaging, uh, which Boosley was referring to, um, you know, where the packaging between the two different products were looking the same, uh, which is on the form as well. We haven't uh, had any issues regarding that. So no, we haven't reported to the manufacturer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I come in there as well, um, Mel? Mm -hmm. so, so from the regulatory point of view, if these are brought to our attention and when we do an analysis, we see a challenge in terms of the medication error potential or be it it has actually occurred and then resulted with an adverse drug reaction. So in that case, we as the regulator, we will make a communication with the relevant pharmaceutical in, uh, company to inform them of the safety concerns um, around the, the, the medication. And then um, we would work with the company to see how best can we improve on the system to ensure that we eliminate any potential or even um, an, a medication error that has occurred. That has actually happened on several locations. Thanks. Okay, this is a question for Sapra. How is Sapra managing the doctor's right hand, bad handwriting? Okay, as a direct cause of medication errors. In a typical retail pharmacy setting, doctors get so irritated when you call to confirm a script content. Patients are impatient and lodge complaints regarding the pharmacy personnel. I'm not sure, um, Busi or Flora, whether it's something that SAPRA okay. as an organization manages. Okay, from um, SAPRA's side, we do not necessarily manage the uh, practice of um, healthcare professionals, but what we do. Uh, which is important, which is part of um, what we are currently doing, is to bring to the healthcare professional uh, attention the fact that that um, their handwriting, like we are doing now, it has a potential impact on the medication errors. So we work with other um, institutions like your HPCSA Pharmacy Council, and that's where they deal with the with the practice. However, our mandate is to ensure that we make the medicine safe. And then when we identify issues that pertaining or that has an impact um, on the medicine safety, then we need to communicate with the relevant organization so that the message can go through. And as Pussy has highlighted, part of our um, responsibility is to ensure collaboration and hence um, and, and ensuring that there's awareness out there. And hence we put in this webinars together so that um, patients uh, I mean, healthcare professionals rather, they can be aware and start improving on the practice so that they can eliminate um, the potential of medication error. Um, Prof, I don't know if you want to weigh in uh, as well on this one. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. So I, th I think what we need to do, and I did see uh, a message from the um, South African Pharmacy Council around e scripting. I I'm in big, big favor of e prescribing which has uh, logic around it. And so that there's a system of being able to have checks and balance, drug interactions, allergies, for example, and the total patient history. But at worst is to um, try and facilitate a, uh, an e-scripting e e process. I, I see the pharmacy council have agreed and, and it's up to the pharmacist to verify that that is from a treating clinician. But for me, that would be quite helpful in terms of um, good handwriting and uh, being able to deliver um, uh, leg legible uh, prescriptions. 
the only issue I can foresee is uh, making sure that we get email addresses correctly. And so from a Popia point of view, people aren't sending emails to the wrong wrong email addresses. And so that would be a risk. But, but I think that's an area we should be uh, exploring. Thanks, Prof. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Singh. How would you establish causality in polypharmacy in a psychiatric setting where most patients are elderly and on medication predisposing them to WT prolongation? Um, thank you. I thought that was a prof by the time. Um, okay. I can take it if you want me to. Oh, OK, thank you. Yeah, so, um, so causality assessment is very difficult. And generally what we do is it's, you get a team of people around, uh, around, around a table and that's how you, you do it. So what we would do is, um, is, is to uh, get the report and then get one of the people. Sorry, Sarisha, you can answer as well. I, I just stepped in now. I really am sorry. Um, and and one, what you, one would do is, is get at least one person, everybody review it, one person to present the case. And then one would use one of the tools of causality and uh, try and uh, make a call. Uh, one, if it's something else, if it is truly is medicine related, uh, and and then try from a biological plausibility point of view, from what we know about the medicines, uh, make a call. It could be one medicine, it could be all medicines, or you won't be able to uh, make make a call on that, uh, and 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 then you just have to move forward. And so that would be causality and, and trying to um, uh, decide if, if it actually occurred or didn't occur. I think a spin-off of that is when you review the case is to make sure that there's some follow-up to the um, to the prescribers, to make sure one that polypharmacy or irrational use of medicine isn't occurring. And that could be a bonus spin-off for the patient as well, that one reduces how much is being prescribed, or you've actually made a call and you can drop on the medicines or uh, more appropriately, um, care for the patient. Over. Sorry, Sirisha. No, that's fine, Prof. I have uh, many agreements with you, and uh, especially the polypharmacy issue. I think, um, as you said, we'd need to engage as a team, like at the institutional level, and to try and decrease that uh, and the drug interactions or whatever that's in, uh, causing the QT prolongation. And yes, uh, you know, uh, as you said, there's different A logarithms that the Naranjo want to assess causality. And then the one I had put up, uh, up earlier was the one from the National Coordinating Co uh, Council. Uh, that's another way to do to that, but that's more, yes, to assess the harm. So QT prolongation uh, would fall in one, to one of the other categories. Thank you. Dr. Singh, um, Flora, there's just two more questions I can see on the chat. Um, so, Safra, does the MedSafety app data link to VigiBase? Thanks, Mel. Um, the MedSafety app data, so it fits into our ADR management system, which we call the VigiFlow. And from the VG flow, then we are able to share the data with the VG base. So the simple answer is yes, all the data that we're receiving via the MedSafety app, it's been uh, transferred into the VG base. Thanks. And then just the last question, is SAPRA creating awareness of medical, medical medication errors with retail and hospital pharmacists and all prescribers? Um, so, as everybody may be aware, SAPRA has intensified, or we are intensifying rather, our presence in the space of uh, practice uh, for healthcare professionals. So, um, particularly since 2021, we have been more available, since 2020 rather, we have been um, available on different medias, particularly on the virtual platform, where we put um, webinars together to raise awareness on different medicine safety 
issues. So one of the ways that we are actually um, increasing awareness to healthcare professionals to be aware of these issues is through a platform like this one, where we invite healthcare professionals uh, to come and be part of our webinars and listen to our presentation and ask questions so that we can clarify any other um, thing, some uh, the things that are not understood. And then furthermore, we're putting a program together, a training program, where we will be, um, we are still actually strategizing on how we're going to actually train healthcare professionals because of the resource issues. So we will be starting from the 1st of April, we will be going to provinces to do face-to-face um, -face training, but obviously we will not be able to reach everyone, but we're looking at different strategies of maybe in a district, we focus on the hospital that's leading in that particular district and then we invite pharmacovigilance lead from different facilities and then they will take the message back to the facilities where they will be or where they are based and then furthermore we are working with national department of health so that we can um, make our um, training available on the knowledge hub because that's where most of the healthcare professional um they get uh, information from. So it's another platform that we're looking to use. And then um, finally, we will be making this as well available in an electronic form on the SAPRA website uh, on all the trainings that we are providing. So furthermore, <clears throat> We have uh, we are in the process of issuing um, awareness materials to healthcare professionals um, on email, and then furthermore, also at the different uh, practicing sites with regards to reporting, so that they are aware of all the processes that are in place to promote reporting. So we we're working with provinces at the moment, and um, our availability should be uh, more visible rather. So we are working on it and we are aware that it might be taking time from healthcare professionals point of view who are on the ground, but um, we are working on it. Thanks. One more question, Flora, sorry, I missed it. Um, do we have to add uh, the link specifically for the consumer uh, for their ADR, ADE on the Med Safety app? and its relation to the PI and PIL of meds. Um, okay, that's one of the things that we're actually looking at already because Med Safety App has the capacity or the possibilities of put of sharing um, information that we put on the Sabra website. Um, so it's something that we're looking at. So the answer there is yes, but it's something that we are still looking at it. Yes. Okay, one minute left. Thanks, Laura. That's it from my side. Okay. Thank you, Mel. And um, thank you, everyone, for making time to be with us. As initially I've indicated, we really appreciate you making time and be part of this. And we trust and hope that um, you'll take the message and share with your colleagues so that in the future they can also be part of this. And there will be more of this coming. So um, be on the lookout. Um, as we continue to promote medicine safety and making all healthcare professionals, including the patients, including the public, aware of the um, negative impacts that these medicines can have while they are definitely good to our people. Um, with that said, uh, we hope that you go in to now be on the lookout of medication errors and try and put all processes in place to mitigate against them. Thank you very much and have a great day further. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, bye.